Hello, my name is Nico, and I'm a third year data science major. Um, hi, I'm Juliana, and I'm an economics major. I'm fourth year. Hi, I'm Monica. I'm a third year um, cog sci major. <laughs> So during the voting season, those who are eligible to vote, they receive tax ballots. And these are snapshots of the ones that we had, but they're way longer and can go on for pages, which was impossible to include in the presentation. So the tax ballots can address a number of different questions. Some of them include creating a new tax, for example, to build a stadium, or continuing an already existing tax about school programs, or perhaps you know eliminating a tax altogether. And these tax ballots have um, an impartial analysis done by a city attorney. It is usually the longest part of the tax ballot and goes on for pages. This is like one tenth of it. It is done by city attorney, so it features a lot of legal and formal language, which sometimes is very hard to follow, even though this is supposed to be a very like summary of the proposal. So you'd think it's simple, but it's not. Uh, the tax proposals also feature arguments for and against. So on the right, this is the argument for. And it is actually pretty short, so those are done by pretty much anyone. So anyone can write one and submit it, and after it is approved by the city council, it goes on an official tax ballot. Because they're not done by the city attorney, they're usually written in a way simpler language, so they're not as formal and much easier to follow. So this brings us to our data set and you know, what we had to work with. So before we began our project, we were given all this amount of data and we were thinking, well, how can we approach it? So we started to work with determining what is the right, program for, the right problem for our project. Uh, so if you look at this, our initial state was essentially having a vast amount of raw data of you know, not previously analyzed tax proposals. And our goal was you know, to make sense of the data and create some sort of visual representation of all the different topic alignments and topic shifts that were featured in the tax proposals. Of course, we faced some major obstacles during our research and you know, one of them uh, rooted from the fact that we had a very interdisciplinary group, so we were limited by our skills. And you know, trying to consolidate the data and successfully transfer it to Python without actually losing the majority of the data. So our scale ended up being the amount of salvage tax proposals that we ended up working with. Okay, before we break down the the um, how we got to our problem, let's start with the big question regard surrounding our fiscal democracy project, which is we want to understand how do people vote in local ballots. There are a myriad of factors that go into how people vote. And given the interests of the Fiscal Democracy Project, language was the factor that we wanted to focus on. But still, language is very broad a topic. And so we had to do some digging into the available data sets that we had in order to figure out what we wanted to ask about language. And in observing the tax proposals that we had available to us, we noticed that sometimes the arguments would do a topic shift or a pivot that wasn't necessarily correlated with the ballot question. For example, a ballot question would ask, "Would you like to, would um, would you be willing to pay taxes for this new stadium?" But in the argument, it would be asking, "Forget the stadium. Let's focus on public transit, people." And that was something interesting, interesting to us, and that primed our attention to the arguments. Another factor that um, swayed our attention to the arguments was that in our literature review, reviews, we, n we learned that social factors are a very prominent part in influencing the vote. And of the, of the ballot materials available to us, the arguments were arguably the most social factor because they represented voices from the community. And so therefore, because we checked in with our faculty advisor and he had yet to do this he had yet to ask this question in his um, analyses with the, his data set. This was a gap that we could fill with data science. So as I previously kind of mentioned, we had a lot of constraints and obstacles that we had to overcome during our research. Uh, so essentially the biggest one, as is evident from this slide, was the time and you know making the most out of the data that we ended up salvaging and having for our research. So some of the arguments would gone missing and they were not actually present in the proposal. So it was very hard for us to you know have a very like universal data collection that we could work with. 
Uh, other technical limitations, again, individual skills based on having an interdisciplinary group and, you know, having a very like funky online tools like rejects, which would act up and just not be great at analyzing the data. And another constraint really stems from having the data set itself. As I just mentioned, you would think that the tax ballots are very like, you know, coherent and they're all the same. They're not because we had thousands of tax ballots which ranged from, you know, the 70s, the 80s. They were very uh, different and a lot of them were missing parts of the arguments or rebuttals because those are not actually mandatory. So that happened. So the not available data for every measure was a big constraint. And so taking into account all these constraints, we developed our hypothesis and we hypothesized, um, given our interest in analyzing the topic shifts in the arguments, was that the closer the topics, um, the topics of the argument for and the summary provided in the ballot proposal are to one another, the more likely the proposal will pass, thereby indicating the strength of the argument. Essentially, the, the more on topic the argument for is, the more likely it is to be effective. And in order to approach this via using data science, we would first have to extract the snippets pertaining to the argument for and summary from the tax proposals that we were given and then assign each to its most prevalent topic using topic modeling techniques and then plot those topics onto a, onto a word space and then using the distance between the topics assess how closely aligned the topics are. And in doing so, we came to um, look at some interesting emergent properties. For one, even though our project doesn't deal with a complex social um, technical system that involves humans, it's important to, to remember that language is, all, is created by complex humans. So as such, it's still a very complex system in and of itself, and it's very hard to analyze using data science. Um, and one thing that we came across was that when we were trying to assess um, the data in the words, Individual words as component, the components themselves, when you combine them, they form topics that we, that was our, um, that was the main focus that we wanted to understand. How do these topics emerge from individual words within tax ballots? And how do these topics, um, when graphed together, emerge into a degree of alignment that was essentially the, the crux of our question. And so this is the graph that we got when we started to visualize all of our documents on their word space. And for each document, there's two points which contains the impartial analysis and the argument for, and these are connected by a line. But like looking at this, it's super confusing. So we're going to explain a little bit about what it means using an analogy. So um, let's say we have a string of text that says, I love raccoons. I'm from sixth, so it's relevant, right? But this is a, let's call this a document, but it's, this is hard to analyze, right? It's just a string of text. So we're going to make this a little bit more structured, put in a table where each row is its own document, and then for the columns, it's the unique count of words. But there's a problem, right? If we have more words, right, well, we can plot this one on a three-dimensional space because it has three different columns. There's a column for I love and raccoons, so each of those could be their own axes. And if we plot that based on the word count, we get a point somewhere there. But like I was saying, if we have more text with you know more words, like I really love raccoon, we get another dimension of data. And suddenly, it's a lot harder to visualize in four dimensions. And as we get more and more documents, the amount of distinct words increases, and suddenly we have that. So <laughs> what we used was a technique called principal components analysis, which can project multidimensional data. And in our case, we had around 2,400 columns of unique words. And it can project it using linear transformations onto however many dimensions you want. And in our case, we put it on a two-dimensional plane. And when it creates these components or these dimensions, it creates a vector that has, in, has a word. And for each word that's contained within this vector, there's a weight that represents how much it affects this axis. And this is how 
the topics start to come together. And if we plot these um, vectors on a two-dimensional space, we can see how much certain terms affects the clusters. And so <laughs> this also looks really confusing, but the ones in pink are the top 30 most important um, phrases. So in the top right, we have schools, and the bottom right, we have district. And if you start to interpret these axes as like a sort of polarity, you can see that going from top to bottom, it's more um, public to private. And then left to right, we couldn't figure that one out. But <laughs> So when we look back at our actual graph, it's, it's sort it sort of helps us to contextualize what's going on. And perhaps one of the things that we should have done differently was look at documents that contain things other than schools, because here we have a very large cluster of words that do not include schools. And then on this side, we have more documents that only talk about schools. So what we tested was the topic alignment or the topic shift. And to do that, we calculated the Euclidean distance between the impartial analysis and the argument for on this graph, and then looked for the, if there was a correlation between this. And then, unfortunately, we had a value of about 2.8%, which is uh, not good. It means there's <laughs> not much correlation between the result and the distance. And to test the statistical significance of this, we used a permutation test, which means that if we have in a row each document and then the result being whether it passed or failed and then the Euclidean distance for there, and we shuffle it around, It'll, rep it'll simulate a distribution in where everything is due to chance. And if we simulate this however many times we did, which was 500, and then we plot our correlation, where within this distribution, we see it's sm it falls straight in the middle, which means it's completely random, basically. So that's great. So <laughs> what does this mean? Well, it means that whether or not there is a topic alignment or um, a divergent topic alignment, um, it doesn't particularly influence it for this data, but we're not sure whether or not it's because people don't read the arguments in the local tax ballots, or it, whether or not people are even delivered these, right? So. So to recap, we used creative heuristics and tried to observe the data by reading like individual tax ballots, which was a lot of fun. And we actually noticed that the topic shifts are very explicit. They do happen. So unless you don't read the document, you like you should know that they happen. So we were wondering if you know the topic adherence could be used as a universal tool of persuasion because you know if the argument does not even stay on topic, are you more or less likely to vote? You'd think no, but who knows? So this, uh, even though our hypothesis ultimately was rejected, we are now having the opportunity to ask bigger questions. For example, about content significance. You know, if we assume that people do read the documents that they're presented with, we can ask ourselves. Are they absorbing and analyzing the new information, or are they only using their previously established opinions and experiences when forming a decision? So do you guys have any questions about our project? So how, how big was your corpus? Um, we had around 2,400 documents initially, but, oh, yeah, forgot about this. Um, we had about 2,400 documents initially, but not all tax ballots there um, contain an argument for or an argument against, and some of them are also duplicate documents. So when we filtered everything out, we ended up with something around like 1,000, and then we tested that, but there was also a problem with how to, how the project initially created the file names, so we just started ha having to reduce more and more data. So in the end, we ended up with like 500 documents. But that's one of our things we'd like to go back and do is kind of make it more robust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a conjecture that maybe the reason why you need to find the project is to rule out other factors like the state of the economy. And if you do this work of tax measure or budget measure, how many mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely. No, yeah, we, we wanted to specifically look at language because in our in the project's past with our what our professor has done, he's seen correlations between whether or not if a tax ballot contained the word continue, there is a high correlation that people are more likely to um, 
continue to vote for that tax ballot because it's already something that's been um, it's already something that's been enacted. I don't remember off the top of my head. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> hmm? I have no idea. <laughs> Um, no, we looked at it strictly in a two-dimensional plane because it's easier to visualize. We could have used, like, if we assigned supervised topics before to all the individual documents, we could see whether or not those fall closer together and compute a metric for that. But that's like 2,400 documents to label individually. <laughs> So thank you all. I uh, just want, want one more round of applause. And I also want to say that this, this group, thanks. Um, when I was talking to your advisor, he had a wonderful analogy. So first of all, so many LOs. Congratulations. <laughs> well done. So uh, 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 Professor Martin had said uh, and provided you guys with a wonderful analogy for research that I'd like to leave you all with. That it's like, look, you know, we're on our way to making a beautiful, delicious cake. And I can't promise you that at the end it's going to be beautifully decorated with lots of icing but we will have cake. And I think that they, de you, you had cake. I don't know if you liked it or not. <laughs> nice. So I hope you all, thank you for coming. Uh, I hope you all got, enjoyed your taste of research uh, and that this, this a new thing that we're doing here at QI. Um, but I thank you all for participating and being the first in. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Take care.